The information I'm going to share with you this morning is drawn from a number of sources. Yesterday in the, the keynote, when I was really just sort of taking you through some of the kinds of sources that Striving Readers is rel- relying on and so on, I, you know, I listed a whole bunch of, of major reports and so on. And I got to tell you, uh, especially those reports that focus on the younger kids, I'm going to be relying on those. That's where this is coming from. But it's also coming from my own personal practice as, well, uh, at one point uh, as director of reading for the Chicago Public Schools, where I was responsible for the reading lives of 437,000 kids, and I had 26,000 teachers that I was responsible for. Uh, A lot of the things I'm talking to you about today are things that I uh, implemented in Chicago uh, with my 600 schools. So uh, I, I can talk about these things both in terms of what does the research tell us, but also my own experiences in terms of applying these things and, and, and putting them to use in, well, and frankly, in raising reading achievement in our city, uh, something that I was very proud to do. And I've certainly done those things as a consultant as well, worked with folks who've done those things as a consultant as well. Uh, I'm going to try to not just share research with you, but try to put it into some kind of an organization or a scheme that will, I hope will make sense to you and will allow you to maybe hang on to some of this stuff. And just like any of my presentations, this information is all available on my website, so if you want that, you can, you can get it. Um, Purpose of the presentation today, to provide a framework for thinking about the improvement of early literacy. I'm talking pre-K through grade three, though I've got to tell you, the overall organization of what I'm sharing with you really goes all the way up. It it covers the whole, you know, pre-K 12. Um, And to provide a review of the major evidence-based findings from those public research reports. And so... Let me start with some some things that I think you know, uh, but we never think about and we don't talk about, and I think they're extremely important in terms of of what we plan and what our our administrative and instructional actions should be when it comes to trying to improve reading achievement or any kind of academic achievement, really. And and the, the first notion... It's going to seem obvious. I apologize. You could have slept five more minutes. Um, (laughs) Learning is individual. Um, All I mean by that is that everybody learns through their own experience. Just just as I was about to start, a young woman came running into the room who says, you know, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, so I missed your disciplinary literacy talk. Somebody told me it was good. I'm trying to find, you know, the, the PowerPoint. Can you help me? She wasn't here. She didn't get to hear anything I said about disciplinary literacy. She didn't get to learn any of that. Her friend was in the room, got to listen, got to ask questions, got to interact. She had an opportunity to learn. Her friend didn't. Her friend might have been learning something else through her experience, but she wasn't there. The point is, folks, what we do in rooms like this ultimately aren't the point. They don't really matter. Uh, they're, not, they're not what we're really trying to get at because the only way they matter is if they actually change kids' experience. Um, it, it's their experiences that, that make a difference. So you buy a new reading program that supports all the kinds of things I'm talking about. That's a good thing. And your teachers leave it on the shelf because they like what they've been doing. That means you bought a new program, but it didn't change anybody's experience. That's a problem. Uh, Gee, you have a program now that delivers some of what I'm talking about. You buy a new program that continues to deliver those things. That's probably not going to change kids' experience much, so I wouldn't expect to see any change in their academic learning. It's always going to be what affects the kids' experience. The only actions that can enhance learning are actions that alter experience in some way. But that raises a question. And the question it raises is, what is experience? How do we define it? How do we think about that? 
And I'm going to suggest to you, maybe I'm simplifying too much, but I'm going to suggest that experience, anybody's academic learning experience has three components or three aspects. And it's those aspects we have to pay attention to. It's those aspects that make a difference in kids' learning. If you want to see higher reading scores, if you want to see kids doing better in literacy, uh, you're going to have to, one way or another, address one, two, or three of these aspects of experience. It's no way around it. The first one is how much experience do kids get? How much academic experience do you have an opportunity to learn, to, to, to gain from? Um, I'm not claiming that every minute of experience is equal and that some things you don't lead to more learning or less learning than other things, but time matters. Um, you know, it, it's, I'm going to take you through some of the research on that, but basically the, the, the overall finding of that research is kids who get more academic experience learn more of those things than kids who don't get academic, th that much academic experience. More is better than less. It's really brilliant, isn't it? I, I mean, again, it's just insightful as all get out. And the second one when it comes to academic experience is what does that experience focus on? What does it actually give you an opportunity to learn? The content of the experience, the, well, frankly, the curriculum. Um, it's, some of these research findings might seem trivial, but basically what studies have found is kids are more likely to learn what they're taught than something else. I mean, I just, that it, 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 it's, if you decide, man, math is the most important thing in our curriculum, and I'm going to spend two hours a day teaching math, and those other schools are only going to spend an hour a day teaching math, don't be shocked when your kids know a heck of a lot more math than in the other school. It just isn't, remember, it's their experience that matters, and if their experience is all focused on one thing or, or another, that's tends to be what gets learned. And the third aspect of experience is the quality of that experience. Um, and I don't have a great definition for this one. Time is easy. We can do time in minutes, right? Uh, content, you know, the content of the experience, when it comes to you know, what we do, what part of the curriculum are we emphasizing? How much time did we spend on that part of the curriculum? Quality, I have a really lousy definition of. Imagine, we're going to do a little thought experiment. We're going to do a little thought experiment. This gentleman and I are going to put our teaching skills up against each other. Uh, we're, going to, we're, going to, we're going to take groups of kids, and these are randomly assigned. These are equal groups. You don't get a better group than I do. These kids learn just as well. And we're going to be... We're going to make sure time is equal because you're going to give us each an hour to teach whatever this is. So it, if he outdoes me, it's certainly not going to be because he spent more minutes because we both get 60 minutes with these kids. And we're going to make this one simple. We're going to, it, it's a list of vocabulary words that we want kids to know in some particular way. So, you know, we've got, you know, and, and I don't, it's 25 words. You, you know, you and I get an hour to try to teach these kids 25 words. And so it's not going to be, wow, he, he was teaching a completely different curriculum than me. We were trying to teach the same thing for the same amount of time. At the end of the hour, his kids know 15 of the words and my kids know 10 of them. What did we do differently? Well, he uh, had the kids interacting more than I did. Right? So he got them to respond more. I just kind of gave him a lecture about the, what the words were. Hmm, that must be a quality difference. Quality differences are those things that aren't time and aren't content <laughs> that make a difference in learning. Uh, you know, he got the kids' attention. I was letting the kids kind of wander around a bit. Um, you know, he made them sit close to them and, you know, was looking them in the eye and, Man, oh man, those are all quality differences. And, and in fact, and, and he explained to them right up front what they were supposed to learn. I just kind of launched in on the list. So there are a whole bunch of things he did 
that changed the kids' attention, that changed what they could get out of that hour of work on you know, that set curriculum. Those are quality differences. And, and so uh, it's a negative uh, definition, but it's, it's anything that isn't time or isn't content that makes a difference in learning. And those are really tend to be teaching differences. They tend to be how we presented the experience, uh, how we allowed it to be carried out. Those are it, guys. It, you know, if you want to know what makes a difference in kids' learning, that's the list. We can all go home now. You know, the rest is, the rest is commentary. And it really is. That, the rest of this talk, what I want to talk to you about is some of the kinds of supports that we have that tells us that we know these are, are really critically important. And that, uh, frankly, any plan for improving achievement. Have any of you ever been involved in a, an instructional project, a curriculum project of any kind that raised achievement? The, the kids did better after that. Just a show of hands. Who's been involved in such a thing? Many of you. Okay. I'm going to surmise. In fact, I, I'm going to go farther than surmising. What the heck? I'm going to come right out and say that not a single one of those projects that you said worked didn't do one, two, or three of these things. That you didn't, well, you know, after we'd made those changes, we were actually spending more time teaching reading than we had been beforehand. Or, you know, we hadn't been teaching phonics, but then we added phonics to the curriculum, and it, it made a real difference for some of our kids. Or, you know, we... We made sure that all of our teachers were explaining the purposes of lessons, and boy, we had the supervisors going into the rooms and making sure they were doing it, and we used to question the kids when we'd go around and find out if they knew why they were doing things. And boy, once we did that, learning went up. You do one, two, or three. Well, we adopted SFA. I don't know that we did any of that. If you adopted SFA, you, you increased the amount of time, and you probably added something to the curriculum, and you maybe even improved the instruction in a couple of ways. Well, we used reading recovery. with Uh-huh, which meant you gave some kids extra time. <laughs> it's, it's always what makes a difference are these things. So instead of focusing on, well, we've got a program or we've got a routine, why don't we focus on all the active ingredients in anything that works? Because going at those directly, which is what I did in Chicago, pays off. So let's start with amount of instruction. And when it comes to amount of instruction, when we look at the large-scale analyses that, you know, take like whole like national data sets and so on and look at various variables that might make a, a difference, the one that comes out picking up the most variance is the amount of experience, the amount of teaching that kids get. The more teaching you get, the better you do. Uh, it comes out as the, the single most important alterable determinant of learning. There are things that we can't alter. I can tell you right now, Kids whose families uh, don't speak English, th those kids tend not to do quite as well in American schools. They don't get as high achievement. That's unfortunate, but, you know, I can't actually change whether those kids grow up in families where the folks don't speak English. That's not something that's under my power. Uh, I can tell you that kids whose mothers have higher amounts of education do better in our schools but I don't have any impact over whether mom has college education or not. I can't change that. I can't fix that. I can change how many minutes we devote to vocabulary instruction in a classroom. That's an alterable determinant. That's something that helps determine kids' learning, but I can change it. I can do things about that. Um, Let's see, what evidence is there that the amount of teaching experience makes a difference? Evidence of increases in learning due to increases in the amount of instruction, academic experience is extensive, consistent, and overwhelming. Uh, one of my colleagues has estimated, there, not talking reading research, but education research, uh, has estimated there's something like 10,000 studies showing the importance of amount of instruction. And those range from things that are... You know, correlational studies where essentially, you know, we'll go and look at, you know, how many hours of schooling kids get and correlate it with achievement gains. 
uh, to experimental studies where people actually go in and say, what if we change the amount of instruction we give to some kids, what would happen? And what happens is more learning. And, and so it's, it's kind of overwhelming uh, how much there is. Um, some of you who work in preschool, and who is that? Can, if I can see some hands, welcome to you folks. Happy to have you here. You guys probably know these statistics better than anybody. Uh, I just want to point out, these, these are uh, a summary of part of the data out of a study done by Hart and Risley. Hart and Risley collected data in, what, 36 or 37 families. Um, they... they audio taped uh, the language experiences that young children were getting uh, from the age of 16 months to, uh, uh, you know, two years after that. And they, they analyzed these data a lot of ways. So there's, there, this, these are the part that are best known. But essentially, they compared, they had some welfare families, they had working class families, they had professional families like your own. And one of the things they looked at is how much adult language were kids, were these babies essentially being exposed to. And then they, they took that hour a month and they extrapolated it across, well, how many waking hours do kids have where they're in the care of their parents? You know, it kind of matters that babies sleep a lot. And, and so you can't just multiply everything times 24 hours. But when they did that, what they found is by the time kids were entering school, they were estimating that the children from professional families were having 30 million more words spoken to them by the adults than were the kids from the welfare families. And in fact, there are organizations now, you know, how do you close the 30 million word gap? How much exposure to language, even before kids enter school, has an impact on kids' language learning? And, you know, there are quality differences as well. Uh, there are people who find these statistics to be controversial. I know there's a, some folks have reanalyzed those extrapolations, and they say it's not a 30 million word gap. It's only a 22 million word gap. Um, we're not going to go down that road. I think the point here is quite simply academic experience, and in this case, if we're talking reading, language is an academic experience, the kids who get more exposure to adult language, to more sophisticated language, are likely to make more gains in language and come to school knowing more words and being able to understand more complicated sentences and so on than kids who get less of that experience. So I'm not even talking just your school day or just what you do, but academic experience, especially in an area like reading, can come through things that happen outside of school that are under the parents' control, under the scouts' control, under the church's control, under the, the zoo's control, you know, whoever it is that your, your kids are working with. And that matters. So I'm not throwing that kind of time out. Here's what I think is the easiest example to explain. If, I had, if you're trying to explain to your community this issue of the importance of time, I've always thought half-day versus full-day kindergarten is the easiest place to do that. Which is better for kids? Where do they learn more, say, reading and math in a five- or six-hour day or in a two-and-a-half- or three-hour day? There are a lot of studies on this one, guys. People have studied this one over and over again, always with the same result. Guess what? Five or six hours is better than two-and-a-half or three if, if we're interested in how much kids are learning. Now, you know, they're always, yeah, but my kid's going to be tired, or there's going to, those are different issues, right? You know, there, there, there are reasons why, or a school board, well, that's really great, but, you know, we'd have to rebuild our school because we don't have enough classroom space. I get those issues. Those, you know, those are, but I'm here talking to you about what makes a difference in kids' learning. There are reasons at times why we can't provide a particular support, but that doesn't mean that support doesn't work or wouldn't be useful. Um, and I certainly had this battle in Chicago. Full-day kindergarten increases academic experience by about one month per year. Full-day kindergartens 
uh, consistently outscore half-day half kindergartens on achievement tests. Full-day kindergarten has stronger, longer-lasting benefits for children from low-income families or with few educational resources prior to kindergarten. And let me, I, I want to make a, this makes the point that more instruction is better than less instruction, but let me, I want to make another point with it. I'll tell you an anecdote. A few years ago, I was asked to speak to the uh, education committee of the state of Oregon, uh, of their state legislature. Now, that, that sounds grand, but the way that really works is it, it, it's, uh, they bring in a group of people. You know, I want you to go talk to them. I want you to go talk to them. You're going to talk to them. You're going to, and, you know, you're going to talk about math, and you're going to talk about spelling, and he, you're here to talk about amount of instruction and this. And you each get a minute and one slide, or five, maybe five minutes, and one slide. What slide do you want? And so I was supposed to be talking about amount of instruction, and I picked this slide, like an idiot. Um, <laughs> then the reason I say that is because the guy before me, and you know, this wasn't like we were all coordinated together, it was they invited all these people to talk. The guy before me was from the University of Oregon, and he was there to, to tell them the results. The state had actually invested a bunch of money in full-day kindergartens around their state, and they wanted to know if they should roll it out to the rest of the state or discontinue it. And he had all the data from like two years of work on this, and, he, and his was the slide just before mine. Now, in the old days, that wouldn't have been any big deal because I would have just taken that power, that, that overhead you know, uh, transparency and dropped it on the floor and stepped on it and apologized and, and just worked without one. I would have given one of the other examples I'm going to give you. But it's in the deck. There's nothing you can do. And so he, he presents the results, and his results were very, very interesting. They gave the, they, they rolled it out in about half the state, so half the state gets... Full-day kindergarten, half the state gets half-day kindergarten. They test these children on 13 different measures, you know, baby dibbles and all those different kinds of things. 13 different measures of language and literacy. And on every single measure at the end of that first year, the full-day group outperforms the half-day group. Boy, you talk about easy, this is beautiful, and then the second year data, they follow these children to the end of first grade. And at the end of first grade, they found that they couldn't tell the children who had gotten the extra boost in kindergarten from the kids who didn't get that extra tuition. And now it's Mr. Shanahan's turn <laughs> with this stupid slide. <laughs> now what do you do, smart guy? Well, not surprisingly, the question came up. <laughs> Why, you know, this is a very expensive intervention. Why should we put money into expanding this if, uh, if, it, if it's a result that doesn't last? It's a very real result, but it doesn't last. And I was fortunate because there is research on this. Um, and so I, I answered their question with a question. I thought that was a smart thing to do. I said, well, you know, in, in your, your funding of this, how much money did you set aside to upgrade the first grade curriculum? And she said, what do you mean? I said, well, if you're teaching these kindergarten kids a lot more than you used to, shouldn't you assume when they go into first grade that they're at a higher level, and therefore shouldn't the first grade teachers be teaching them at that level, not where they were? She said, well, you certainly think of educational reform differently than we do. And I said, I think I do. <laughs> I said, let me tell you about a study done back in the 1970s in my state by a lady named Dolores Durkin. Some of you might remember Dolores Durkin's work. Dolores Durkin uh, took a group of preschool students, and she taught them to read. Now, I'm not saying she gave them reading instruction, and at the end of it, they knew six more letters than the kids who hadn't been getting the new curriculum, like we do with Head Start and things like that. No, I'm saying she took these children and she taught them to read. All these children could actually pick up a book and read it. 
and not something they'd memorized or not something they'd read before. They could actually read it and understand it and explain it, and they could read. And then she followed those children for four years, she followed, or three years. She followed them into kindergarten, and these didn't all go into the same classrooms or the same schools, so she had to go around the whole area where she was living and, and, and uh, you know, track these kids down, but they followed them. And what they found in kindergarten is those children, they taught them their letter names. And by the end of the year, all the other kids were a little closer to them. And at, in first grade, they taught them the letter sounds. They could decode those simple CVC words. And by the end of second grade in that study, they were exactly the same. The point that I want to make to you is this, and it's an extremely important point. And it's not really about kindergarten or half days or full days. It's the amounts of instruction that we give. If, if we increase the amount of instruction to kids uh, through a particular program or effort, that will give them a boost. But over time, if we then take away that extra tuition and don't keep, keep it in, in place, don't expect that those kids to stay where they are. I'll give you another example, and this is a, a more widespread one. We invest a lot of money and a lot of instruction in Head Start programs. And Head Start is, despite some of the claims against it, is a wonderful program for a lot of reasons, but let me just focus on the education part, which is the part that I'm usually responsible for. Uh, in the last few years, Head Start has increased the amount of academic teaching that the kids got, and in fact, the kids are doing better on various academic measures. But think of how that actually plays out in our schools. When those four-year-olds go to kindergarten, we test everybody to see how they're doing in reading. And quite often, those Head Start kids are doing better than the other kids that are entering school. So what do we do about that? We take Title I money and give extra instruction to the other children. And by the end of kindergarten, or sometimes the end of first grade, you can't tell the difference. It doesn't matter when you give this extra time. It matters how much extra time. And so if we keep using our money, I'm going to give you guys a little extra. Okay, you're doing better. Now I'm going to give the extra to them. You're not moving anybody forward. All you're doing is keeping it all equal. It, so time is, it, it, if I were an economist, I would say time is frangible. That's what they say about money. You know, money is better than having a, a money economy is better than having a trading economy because money is frangible. You can trade money for anything. Whereas if I wanted to trade this projector, some of you might not want a projector, so I'm going to have trouble getting rid of it. Time is frangible. You can move it around and use it different ways. The school districts say, oh, you know, we're only going to have school four days a week instead of five because we have these budget problems. My question is, are you going to cut the amount of instruction? Well, you know, we're going to increase those, those, the lengths of those four days. We, oh, yeah, we are going to cut the amount of instruction. It's the cutting the amount of instruction that matters. It isn't, oh, we're going to do it in four days instead of five days. That's not where the, where the issue is. So... We do this to ourselves over and over again and keep finding our programs aren't effective because all we're doing is making sure that any extra teaching that somebody gets doesn't get counted. It's kind of a crazy way to do it. I don't love this one, and this is very controversial, and you've seen these before. This is comparing lengths of school years of various countries against each other. And these are... These are problematic, these comparisons, and, and certainly but while they correlate in the way I said that they show that countries with longer school days tend to do better, <clears throat> the correlations aren't stupendous. And one of the reasons is these schools might have different lengths of school years, but they might have also different lengths of school days. And so, you know, some of these might look like they're getting more education than others, but they're really not. Uh, not everyone uses their school years the same way as, as well, so it gets a little complicated. But the, the point of it is, if you look, you know, we have 180 to 185 school days in the states, 
But a lot of our trading partners, including countries that outperform us or who have been passing us and so on in these international comparisons, are spending more days than others. The one I like to focus on is Korea. And the reason I focus on Korea is because when I was a, a young man in, in, you know, in, in school, uh, South Korea was a third world nation. And the United States was educating the largest proportion of its population uh, were graduating high school, were going to college, and so on and so forth. Uh, now <laughs> that I'm an old man, uh, a few years ago, South Korea passed us in the proportions of, of their kids who are going to college and graduating from college. And you look and go, well, wait a minute, how did they do that? And one of the ways they did that is they looked at America's experience because early in the 20th century, we had taken what most states was about 100, 110, 115 uh, day school year and turned it into a 180 day school year. And we had all those states that had, yeah, they had a school year, but you didn't actually have to go, go and they you know, put in compulsory education and so on. So they went to a 225-day school year, weeks over what we get. And I'm not saying that's all they did, but how do you think we'd do in international comparisons if we actually could teach kids as much as they get to teach them in other countries? Right? And if you have any doubts about that, Here's a study that uh, Fred Morrison and his colleagues did in my town. Uh, they extended the school year in kindergarten by 30 days in, in some of our schools. In other words, they added three weeks at the beginning of the year and three weeks at the end of the year and increased uh, the reading achievement by a full year. They also increased the math achievement by a full year with that. Um, so if you think our teachers can't do that too, yes, they can. But amount of instructions are really big deal, guys. Um, everything I have said so far in, in my examples are things that you probably don't have control over and that you're not going to be able to say, oh, well, with our striving readers' money, we're going to you know, go year-round school. And, you know. All I've been trying to do is show you how important time is. What I'd like to do now is drill down to variables that you actually do have control over that are time variables. And, and just a couple of examples. Back in the 1970s, when this time issue first started to really get a lot of attention from researchers, the concept of academic learning time, or ALT, came up. And it's a really important idea. Because what they started to find is that there were big differences in amounts of time devoted to things like reading instruction that actually could learn, lead to learning. And so what they did is they started putting observers in classrooms. You know, instead of looking at, well, how, long, how many minutes a day are your kids going to school versus how many minutes a day are your kids going to school, they started looking at, let's go visit the second grades in your school and see how much instruction the kids are actually getting. Well, we have that. The state collects that. We all fill that out. Yeah, the principals fill that out. And amazingly, every classroom in the district has the same amount of minutes devoted to reading. But if you go and look in the classrooms, like a few weeks ago, I was in a kindergarten classroom, and this sweet young thing who was teaching sat down to, you know, at the carpet where she was going to have these, these kids, she was going to read to them and, and talk about the text. And it was just beautiful, except for the fact that about six of the kids were running around the classroom and crawling under the tables, and no one was paying any attention to what she was doing at all. There wasn't a chance in the world that those kids were learning anything about literacy, but those minutes would all be counted as literacy instruction. And so what they started doing is saying, well, let's measure how many minutes of actual learning time these kids are given. And now you find as much as 100% differences between two classrooms. I'm not talking about, oh yeah, you know, second grade teachers can vary or first grade teachers can vary. I'm talking... You and you are teaching in the same school, in the same hallway, in the same grade level, and your, your kids are getting 90 minutes a day, and your kids are getting 45 minutes a day. Gee, I wonder, you know, I, I don't get why your kids keep doing better, Aaron. You know, because you're using the same reading program. So, see, we know reading programs don't help. 
except, wait a minute, that's not really what's going on here, because your kids aren't really getting very much instruction. Uh, some examples of what I'm talking about, Barbara Taylor in, in her work where she was looking at these beat-the-odds schools and beat-the-odds teachers, folks who were being very, very successful in teaching reading in situations where they're not supposed to be. Well, look at this with K-3 teachers. The ones who were being very successful were keeping their kids on task 96% of the time. The less effective teachers had their kids on task 63% of the time. We, we have the same allotted number of minutes of instruction, but if 96% of the minutes I'm giving have a chance of kids learning, and 63% of the minutes you're giving have a chance of succeeding, who do you think is going to win? Who do you think is going to end up with higher reading achievement? One of the things I did in Chicago, I had hired coaches, and I was putting reading coaches in the classroom and pouring out tons of professional development, but at some point it became obvious that at least in a, a sector of my schools, it didn't matter how much the teachers knew about reading instruction if they couldn't get classroom order. And so I brought in some experts and that kind of stuff to, and targeted them on those schools so that those teachers would actually get some minutes of instruction. I mandated a large number of minutes, but you can mandate anything you want if, it, if the teacher doesn't have the skill to actually use that. The academic learning time doesn't go up, just the number of minutes that you put into that subject does. Some of you might know the, what's known, often called the little green book, uh, the annual growth for all students, catch up growth for those who are behind by Lynn Fielding, Nancy Kerr, and Paul Rozier. Those of you who do know the book know that those aren't researchers. Uh, Lynn Fielding was the president of the school board in Kennewick, Washington, and these other folks were administrators in the district. Essentially, back in, a, 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 a while ago, uh, the, back in the late 1990s, like a lot of states, the state of Washington got a, a, a bug in their, a bee in their bonnet that they're going to do what Ohio is doing now. You know, we're going to get everybody up to a third grade level by third grade. You know the, the routine. My state did that for about 10 minutes. Um, you know, governors like that. They could say that kind of stuff, and then they wouldn't necessarily do anything about it, perhaps. Well, these guys were kind of crazy. They, they adopted this as their goal as a school board, and they actually stayed with it. And, well, let me just show you an example. And I've just lifted this out of their book, so I'm not, these aren't data that I've analyzed or something, folks. Started in 1995, 57% of the third graders were meeting or exceeding state standards. And so they set a goal, I believe, of 95%. They wanted it to be 95%. You know, really nice. And so they put in some professional development. They bought a new reading program. And you can see they got it up to 72%, which is pretty terrific. That's usually where most of these reform efforts are done. Okay, yeah, we said 95, we got 72, see, we succeeded. Um, <laughs> and it's certainly better. I mean, this is a good thing what they did here. 72%, 72%, 68%, not exactly where they wanted to be. But these guys were persistent. And so they start... At this point, they're going, this isn't working, we have to do more. They figured something out. And what they figured out was that this amount of instruction was actually a big deal. It took them four years to get there. That's my only criticism of, of them, that if this is such a big finding in education, why did it take them four years to figure out that the amount of instruction mattered? Because they, that the reasoning they did is they said, look, when we look at our standardized test results, our boys and girls are making a year's progress for a year's instruction, which is true in my school district, my former school district as well. Chicago Public Schools, we start out really low, but our kids make a year's gain for a year's instruction. That's a, that's a good thing. So they figure, well, how, how much time, how much instruction does it take on average for us to get our kids there? And what they were finding is those kids were getting 60 to 80 minutes a day of reading instruction in their classrooms. It varied by grade level and so on, but 60 to 80 minutes gave them a year's growth. So they did the simple calculation of, well, if she's a year behind and I want to catch her up to grade level, 
and it takes me 60 to 80 minutes to move over the one year that she's in to catch her up a year, I'm going to need another 60 to 80 minutes a day. And you can say, well, there are reasons why that could be off. Let's not worry about it. It's just a simple calculation, right? So, and it, it has ramifications. If you buy it, gee, if, it, if I let a kid get to third grade who is a year behind, that's going to cost me an extra 60 to 80 minutes a day. So now I need 120 to 160 minutes of instruction, which I can probably still provide. What if I let them get two years behind? Very quickly, you start to figure, well, we'd have to shut down everything else we do with the kid. We'd have to drop all other curricula if we're going to catch kids up. So it really has multiple kinds of ramifications. One is time matters a lot. If you want to fix some of these kids' problems who are behind, giving them more tuition will give them a chance to catch up. But it also says kids can get so far behind that we just don't have the resources to catch them up, and therefore you've got to start catching them earlier uh, monitoring, testing, doing whatever it takes to, to find out, or you, you won't be able to meet their needs. When they started identifying these kids and giving them extra instruction each afternoon to keep them up, look what their numbers got to. And they just continued on like that. And they have this for school after school in their district. I just picked one example. Boy, I wish everybody would do that but it means paying attention to time and, and, and using it. There's a, there's a scheme a theory that I think is, is quite wonderful, and I, I use this all the time in my thing. It's old. Some of you probably had it in some of your graduate classes many years ago. But John Carroll, back in the 1960s, came up with a model of school learning that all the variables, or most of the variables, were measured in terms of time. It's really kind of an interesting thing. What effect affects learning? And certainly one of the things that affects learning is aptitude, right? How good a learner are you? How smart are you? How well do you pick up language? You know, some kids aren't equal. They're not all equal. They need to be treated equal and, and, you know, politically and, and, and legally and all that. But the fact is they're not all the same. Some kids learn things better than others. And whether that's in their head, you know, some genetic advantage, or whether it's, well, you know, they've just got such a supportive home, uh, you know, their, their environment is so great, they do terrific. It doesn't matter right now. What matters is they differ in, in, in aptitudes. And some are better at math, and some are better at reading, and all that kind of stuff. So how do you measure things? Well, we give them, the, you know, the, the, this test or that test, or we give them an IQ test. What Carroll argued was aptitude tells you how much time you need to learn something. So if you're really a great language learner, you might be able to learn reading in 60 minutes a day. And if the school gives you 60 minutes a day, you're going to do great. I'm really slow with language. You're going to have to give me 90 minutes or 120 minutes because... And that's how he would measure aptitude. How long does it take this person to learn something? Now, that's difficult to measure, but it's an, conceptually, it's an interesting idea. Opportunity is the second variable in his scheme, and that is how many minutes are we willing to give you. And so she only needs 60 minutes to learn this, and the school district allots 60 minutes. She's going to win. I need 90 minutes, and you're willing to allot 60 minutes? Guess what? I will not succeed. I will... It, this isn't a, well, he's just too stupid. I'm too stupid for your 60-minute system. I wouldn't be too stupid for your 90-minute system. Of course, there's more than that. Perseverance. How much time is the student willing to, to put in you know, before they resist or they break down or they go to sleep or whatever it is that they do? And so, yeah, you're willing to give me 90 minutes, but, man, I cannot sit through 90 minutes. I'm just not, you know, it's... I, you know, that matters too. Quality of instruction, very much like I said. Quality, the lower the quality, the more time that's needed, right? Higher quality tends to mean you can do it more efficiently. I can get more learning in, the, that, in that example I gave with you and I. 
the things that I said you were doing were all things that were essentially allowing the kids to learn more for the amount of instructional time. Um, Ability to understand the instruction. The harder the instruction is to understand, the more time that's needed. This one, I don't have a great school example. I can give you a good college example. In my state, uh, at the University of Illinois, um, a lot of our computer science classes and math classes were often taught by Asian immigrants. Asian immigrants who often had very strong uh, dialect and, and, and speech differences and so the students were going, I can't understand the lectures. And so you know, now there are things that have to be done to, to protect against that. But the fact is, if I'm struggling to, to understand what the instructor is telling me, it's going to take me, I'm going to need more time on task with that to learn it. So essentially what he's doing is saying everything is an issue of time. It's all an issue of time. You have to think of all your resources that way. In Chicago, the way we arranged it, because it was such a priority to raise reading achievement, I was director of reading, but don't misunderstand, I was over all other curricula. You couldn't change a bus schedule or a lunch schedule without my permission, because I wouldn't allow any changes that were going to reduce the amount of teaching that our kids were getting. I mean, that's, that, that's how serious it was. And I can go on and on and on. It maybe seems like I already have. <laughs> but I could show you studies on how preschool, of course, increases the amount of instruction kids get and gives kids a, be a learning benefit. There are many school districts these days that are making big efforts to cut down on absenteeism because, remember, it's the kids' experience that matters. If the kids aren't there, I don't care how good your programs are, they're not learning. The, the more kids you have missing uh, that, that you're able to pull back into the system, the more achievement points you can get. Um, the famous statistics, you know, those kids who are missing, what is it, 30 days a year? Uh, have like about an 80% chance of not completing school. They drop out. I mean, that tells you how, how big a difference. Summer school programs, uh, how effective they are at increasing achievement. And that certainly was true in my city. Even snow, number of snow, I know, isn't that crazy? Even the number of snow days. This one, this doesn't even come out of education. There were some sociologists who got this in their head that number of snow days, I know, it sounds silly, uh, number of snow days might matter. So what they did is they got like the statistics over like a 15 or 20 year period up in New England and north, uh, you know, state New York. Upstate New York. And they, they, took their, their test scores from each year, and they took the number of snow days they had, those days where kids weren't going to be in school, and sure enough, there was a very strong correlation that the more days the kids were losing because of snow days, the test scores were going down. I mean, it's, it's Looney Tunes, but it, I'm trying to show you that there's just a ton of data that goes in, in, in this direction. And of course, days with unplanned teacher ab absences kind of work like days without schooling. Um, you know, those substitutes often sort of keep the custodial functions of school going, but often not the academic functions. Planned teacher absences, like when somebody's, you know, having a baby or what, those don't seem to screw things up because we plan for those and we... And I, you can go on and on with this. Does anybody doubt that more teaching is better than less teaching and that anything you do, you've got to make sure that there's more teaching? Okay, so given that, and let me just say, folks, along the way here, I'll, I'll take any questions now if you have any, but if, if, you know, along the way from now on, if you just ask things as, as they come up, I'd, I'd gladly deal with them. I don't want to run over you, but there's a lot of stuff to share. Um, anything now? Well, okay. The, the question, I, I'll repeat it, it's just everyone can hear. Um, Okay, she's not against increasing the, the amount of time that we teach kids, but uh, where does it come from? Uh, you know, what do, we, what do we take away? When I became the czar of reading in Chicago, um, <laughs> you've not lived till you've been a czar. Um, the, what made headlines in the Chicago newspapers, and I mean really headlines up above the fold, um, 
was that I mandated uh, two to three hours a day of, of reading and writing instruction. And Chicago, at the time, had the shortest school day of any major district in the country. So I was really up against what you're, you're concerned about. Um, uh, the, if, you, if you go through and do the math of a, um, of a school day, I think you find out very quickly that uh, certainly in an elementary day, you can work two to three hours in and still give instruction in all those areas. But you do lose things that people build into their schedule, uh, usually to kind of fill it in. And I take a lot of those things away. Not because I say you can't do any of them, but just because there isn't a lot of time to do them. Um, I, I, I got probably more pushback on that at the high school level than I did at the elementary level. So, you know, pre-K-3, the only place where that's a problem is in our half-day programs, and we did have half-day programs. Um, and then I just cut it down and, and say, gee, if, if I say two to three hours and you have a half-day program, then it's one hour to an hour and a half of, of this kind of thing, you know, because of just what you said. I don't want to take away their science or their social studies or the music program or whatever. Um, but you do end up saying, we're not going to have a lot of free reading time. We're not going to have a lot of downtime where, you know, kids can go off and just do things. Um, you know, things are going to have to be more purposeful than that. Um, and, uh, and that worked. At the high school level, the big concern, of course, was they don't have two hours devoted to anything. And so if you're going to say 120 minutes a day of reading and writing, how can we possibly do that? So I got to sit down with our 90 math department chairs and our 90 uh, social science department chairs and our 90 science department chairs and, and explain to them that not only did I expect the two hours of, of reading and writing instruction, but I didn't want a minute in a math class spent on anything but mathematics. I didn't want a minute of a, of a moment, you know, of, of a moment in a science class spent on anything but science and so on, uh, which relieved them that I wasn't kicking them all out and hiring reading people. Um, the, I, I think what you'll, you'll find is we have a tendency, especially in, in the upper grades, to think you can only do one thing at a time. And so, uh, you know, if, if I need somebody to work on... Uh, fluency, and I want the kids to be writing, and I want the kids to be working on reading comprehension things, there's no reason that those can't be done with a, a science book. They don't all have to be done with a reading book, uh, and, and so on and so forth. They don't have to come out of the literature class. Um, so I, it's, I don't have a great answer, except I, I guess I'd just ask you to do the math on your own programs and see what you'd actually have to cut and I think you're going to find you don't really have to cut anything, but you do take away some latitude from folks to just kind of do what they want to do. Now, I mean, if I could wave a wand, guys, and I know you won't like me for this, but if I could wave a wand, I would increase the lengths of your school years. I'd increase the lengths of your school days. We would do a lot of more arts and things like that because of our longer days. And I know there are a lot of educators who go, no, 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 I don't want all that. <laughs> I get it. The nicest thing we do for children is, is put teachers with them. And the more we can do that, the, the better we could do. So if I had my druthers, you wouldn't be making, having to make those kinds of decisions. It would just be, let's add resources and increase the, the length of the days and years. They're probably not going to allow, they didn't allow me to do that in Chicago. They're certainly not going to allow me to do that in Ohio as, a, as an advisor. Um, so... Sorry, you know, it's not a great answer, but it's the best one I have. Let me now take back everything I just said. Um, <laughs> well, first of all, I mean, the second biggest determinant of school learning, again, using those large-scale studies where they do those correlational kinds of things, the second biggest determinant is the content coverage, what we teach. Um, that matters. And I want to talk about, this is the one I'm probably going to spend the most time on because this is going to be the one that's going to have the biggest impact on your applications and so on and so forth. Um, but I want to take back what I've said about, everything I've said about time, because um, I've lied to you. I've misled you. 
It's a tough thing for a speaker to admit to a couple of hundred people, but are there any scientists in the room, any chemists or physicists? Or well, See, I could have gotten away with it. I could have just said anything I wanted. Um, if there were, if we did have such a person in the room, they'd probably be raising their hand about now and, and saying, you know, what he said about time can't possibly be true. You know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Because in the sciences, time can never be a variable. It's not allowed to be a variable. And, and here's why. If you go back about maybe 400 years and you were to ask the greatest scientists in the world why iron rusted, they would tell you time. And they knew that because if you took an iron bar and you set it out in a field and you left it there long enough, it would eventually start turning orange. And so, you know, what made it turn orange? Time. The longer you left it, the rustier it got. What makes iron rust? Oxidation, moisture, right? Time is a measure of how much oxidation, how much moisture in the air and the ground that this iron bar is in contact with. So time can be a measure of how much moisture, but it's moisture that is actually causing the iron to rust. It isn't time. And so if you say, well, time is what causes these kids to learn, scientists would be saying, time's got to be a measure of something. It can't be the variable itself. What is it the measure of? And what it's the measure of is content coverage. How much opportunity am I giving you to learn particular things that are going to make a difference in your, in your learning? Um, the reason why time comes out as a better measure than, amount of, than, than content coverage, time is the easiest thing in the world to measure. I can count that up really e reliably. And so it does better as a measure, but it's misleading because it's always got to be the amount of something and what I'm going to suggest is that in reading, reading isn't like social studies or science or um, uh, the arts uh, uh, or, or uh, most of the things we teach, the content things. If, if you guys weren't here to hear about reading and we were here to, say, talk social studies, maybe you're the high school chairman of high schools across Ohio and we're going to talk about, well, we're going to talk about curriculum coverage. We're going to talk about how much coverage should there be of American history and how much should there be of world history or world culture. What should be the mix? Should it be 50-50? Should it be 75-25? It's a values judgment. It's a choice. If we had the science folks, you know, medical science is a growing part of the Ohio economy. Should we be putting more of our high school time into life sciences, or should we keep it more in physical sciences because we've had, you know, we're doing all these things with petroleum and chemicals and so on. That's a choice. You know, it's, it's not, oh yeah, you know, you can't learn science if you put too much time into life sciences or you put too much time, no, no, no. It's a choice. In reading, it's different. Reading isn't a choice. It, it, literature, you know, which literature you're going to emphasize is a choice. Reading, there are particular things you have to learn to do if you're going to be a reader, right? It's not, oh, there are particular things I want kids to know about. That's great. That's a choice. But you want to be a reader. There are particular things. You want to learn to ride a bicycle. There are particular things you've got to learn to do. You've got to learn to balance. You've got to learn to pedal. You've got to learn to brake. If you don't learn those things, you're not going to be able to ride a bicycle. Yeah, but there's some really cool things I want kids to know about streamers. N you know, no, no, that's not going to, you know, that's a choice. That's not what we're talking about today. So what we're really arguing is teaching those things that research has supported, that we, we know if you teach these things, kids do better than if you don't teach them. They are... One of the problems we have in reading instruction is that because it's a particular set of skills that you have to master, there are lots of ways of learning those. That's also why m multiple programs can work. Even very different programs can work. Um, 
And so you always have things like, well, the research shows that kids who get phonics instruction do better on average than the kids who don't. And some teacher's going to be sitting there saying, I don't believe that. I didn't have phonics when I was a kid, and I can read. Or I don't believe that. Uh, I've been, you know, I taught these kids to read, and they, I don't use phonics. I don't believe in it. We're not talking about whether kids can figure some of these things out on their own or not. I guarantee you they can. It's what gives you the highest, you know, this is like McDonald's. What can we do that's going to give us the highest profit? What are the things we can do that are going to give us the, hard, the biggest learning gains? Well, there's some things that kids can learn on their own. Uh-huh, but we know we can accelerate that, and we can guarantee more kids get that. And we can, in other words, we're always working on the margins, guys. We're not working on whether kids are going to learn to read or not. Kids in Ohio are learning to read right now. I guarantee it. The issue is, can we do any better than that? Can we pull along some that haven't been? Can we get somewhat higher levels with the kids that we uh, you know, have been succeeding with? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. And so I'm showing you the things that give you those, those benefits, that give you the, the, the movement forward. And I am starting with decoding things, but not because decoding things are the most important, folks. But just because, this is a list. Look at it as a dumb list. They're all important. And it's not, oh, you have to do this before you do that. No, not so much. That's not really what the research has found. Phonological awareness refers to the ability to hear and manipulate language sounds, including word and syllable separations and the sounds within spoken words. Young children have difficulty perceiving especially the sounds within words, the phonemes, like a word like cat. They hear cat. They don't hear cat. But we have an alphabetic language. And an alphabetic language, it's kind of nice if you can hear those sounds. If I'm going to try to teach you how to match letters up with sounds and sounds up with letters. If you can't perceive those sounds in any separable way, it's awfully hard to do it. I used to teach first grade. And you say to kids things like, listen to the first sound in bat. First sound? What's he talking about? Bat. You know, the first sound in bat is bat. Um, You know, it's... Hmm, that's going to be tough to teach them the B. Phonological awareness, as I said, is, is this bigger issue. And, and because we're covering both preschool and you know, uh, primary grades here today, uh, I want to talk about phonological awareness because being able to hear the separations between words is really important. Being able to hear the separation between syllables is important. Timothy... Shanahan. Being able to do that is important in terms of what we're talking about. And certainly the the highest level of it is being able to distinguish the individual phonemes or sounds within the words. You know, all that kind of thing. Um, So they're both PA. Certainly by the time kids are finishing kindergarten or sometime early in first grade, we'd like everybody to know... Their, their phonological awareness, their phonemic awareness so well that by you know, that point they can fully segment words without any trouble. In other words, break them into all their phonemes and put them back together and do stuff like that. This is not phonics. We're t- this is kind of something that comes really early in the, in the phonics progression, but it's not the same thing as phonics. It really refers to the, the hearing the sounds. And the studies show us that in, when it comes to development of these skills, kids go from the gross sounds early on to the, the finer grain sounds later on, which is why, gosh, with three- and four-year-olds, you're probably a lot of your time is worrying about things like can they hear the syllables or can they hear, you know, whereas as they get a little bit older, certainly by the end of kindergarten, you're hoping that they, they actually are hearing the phonemes. Where does this stuff come from? Well, I can tell you, When I became a teacher, we didn't talk about things like phonological awareness. We didn't know anything about it. 
But in the 1970s, early 1980s, scientists started wondering about this because they were noticing that this wasn't an IQ thing. This wasn't a, you know, how uh, you know, much money do your parents have thing. Kids, young children, just really had difficulty perceiving those sounds within words. And scientists started wondering about two things. They wondered, first of all, was it possible to accelerate this aspect of language development? Because, in fact, while little kids have trouble with this, older kids, some do, but most don't have trouble with this even without instruction. They figure it out over time. But usually not until they're, they're about 8, 9, 10 years old, which is a little late for learning an alphabetic language. So, hmm. So the, one issue is, can we accelerate it? Can we actually get younger kids to learn this? And two, very important, if we get, can accelerate it and make it possible for, say, five- and six-year-olds to actually hear all these sounds within words, would it actually make any difference in their reading instruction? Would it improve their achievement or not? Uh, if you can't get a yes to both of those, there's no point on it being on my list. There have been more than 100 independent studies of the, those kinds of issues and overwhelmingly, those reports that have analyzed those studies have concluded there is absolutely no question that teaching preschoolers, kindergartners, and even first graders phonemic awareness or phonological awareness make, one, yes, indeed, you can accelerate that development, and two, accelerating that usually means the kids do better with decoding, they do better with fluency, and they even do better with early uh, reading comprehension. And so, why do I say we need to teach it? Because it gives kids a benefit. It's the only reason. It's, it's, you know, it's that simple. Um, the instructional goal is to enable children to be able to easily and quickly fully segment the phonemes within words. The National Early Literacy Panel reviewed nearly 70 studies showing that PA was a strong predictor of later reading achievement, PA remains a significant predictor, even controlling for age, SES, alphabet knowledge, oral language, IQ, or prior decoding ability. The National Early Literacy Panel meta-analyzed approximately 50 studies finding that instruction in PA in pre-K and kindergarten, or PA and kindergarten, uh, combined with alphabet knowledge, uh, and also at, at times combined with phonics, led to significant impacts on uh, phonological awareness, alphabet knowledge, reading, and spelling. Age or developmental level made no difference in the benefits of this kind of teaching, uh, but I want to be careful on this. Because we look, for example, were there differences in how well the kindergartners did versus, say, how well the, the preschoolers did? We didn't find any differences in amount of gain, but you have to remember that doesn't mean they were being taught the same thing. The preschools tended to focus on those larger units and rhyming and things like that, and, and the kindergartners tended to be focused more on the phonemic aspects of it. And so they both made equal gains, but they weren't necessarily covering the same ground. I, I, that's, that's the point I want to make. The National Reading Panel meta-analyzed more than 51, 51 studies finding that phonemic awareness instruction in kindergarten and first grade and with re older remedial readers led to significant improvements in phonemic awareness, decoding, reading comprehension, and spelling. Some of these overlap with some of those other studies, so you can't just add them together. I'm not trying to overwhelm you here. Uh, the National Literacy Panel, this is the one that looked at second language learners found that phonemic awareness instruction was beneficial for second language students as well. However, a caution uh, with second, one of the things we know about phonemic awareness is it is probably the most transferable aspect of language. So if, say, your kids are phonemically aware in Spanish, that doesn't mean now they need, you know, some number of weeks of phonemic awareness instruction in English. There's... They, they, they might need a little bit on, on a few sounds that differ between the languages, but that's about it. it it's, uh, uh, it it's highly transferable. Uh, in terms of the research on the instruction on this, um, phonemic awareness is largely done orally. It, it's, uh, students have to hear the sounds. And uh, however, go, go ahead, <laughs> the, the research... Uh, also highly emphasizes 
the importance of learning letter names at this same time. And in fact, it's kind of a, a push-me-pull-me in preschool and kindergarten and first grade. Gee, I'm giving phonemic awareness instruction. I'm teaching the kids the letter names. I'm teaching them some of the early phonics. And if you're to ask the real experts on this, well, wait, do you do one and then the other? They'd say, no, you know, maybe you, you do some phonemic awareness and then you work on, on you know, some phonics with that and then you go back and do more phonemic awareness. It's kind of a push-me-pull-me. You're going you know, in and out of it, mixing them. Um, uh, brief intensive instruction. It, the National Reading Panel, when it looked at those 51 studies, one of the things we were interested in was the amount of instruction, how much PA instruction was mattering. And what we found, we looked at studies that had uh, the amounts of instruction ranged from as little as an hour to as many as 90-some hours. The biggest gains we saw, the optimum gains that we saw, were uh, instructional routines that were giving kids between 14 and 18 hours of PA instruction in kindergarten or first grade. Now, hold on. Don't go too far. Um, 14 to 18 hours. That didn't mean we concluded, therefore, everybody needs 14 to 18 hours. What we concluded is if you were going to buy a program for those levels, you'd certainly want to make sure it had at least 14 to 18 hours. But let's just consider a couple things. You buy such a program, you're taking your kids through it, and after seven hours, they're fully phonemically aware. They can hear all the sounds within the words, do you need to finish the program? And I'd say, you can, but that's not really the point, right? Okay, you complete the program, and some of your kids aren't fully phonemically aware. Now what? Keep teaching, right? Don't back off. So it isn't a set number of hours, but the, these programs tend to do, to do pretty well. And if you think of what do, what's he talking about, 14 to 18 hours of instruction would be something along the lines of 15 minutes a day for a semester of kindergarten. So it's like, okay, well, that's not crazy. And especially if you're mixing it in with the phonics and the right? I mean, that's not really crazy amounts of time. Um, the instruction that they gave, and this is going to be true of, of phonics as well, most of these studies are looking at individual instruction or small group instruction. In fact, I know in the, the preschool years there isn't a single study of any of this that isn't done well, that's not true. There's a single study um, that's done uh, with, with larger groups. But essentially, it's all done uh, small groups because, well, let's be honest, if you want kids to actually hear those sounds, it's really important that they be able to do things like see your mouth, you know, if you're the teacher teaching it. And so in here, you guys can, in the back can barely see me. My mouth is, you know, forget about it. And so that notion of, of being seated in such a way and being able to get, facilitate interaction. I said there was one study that, that didn't do it that way that's worth mentioning because I think they did something pretty interesting. They delivered the, the, their PA instruction to kindergarten kids in, in whole class. This was in kindergartens and in Title I schools. So there would be like 20 children. But then what they did is monitored kids' learning and did reteaching in groups of three. So if you're teaching that lesson, that set of lessons, and we test you and find that 12 of your kids aren't getting it, you're going to have to go back and do reteaching with four groups of three. You're a better teacher. You've been more effective. Your kids are higher. Something, uh, you know, gee, only three of her kids were lagging in it. She only has to go back and reteach. So they, even that study that did it whole class did reteaching in small groups. So don't get in your head, he wants, he's lecturing to us, and he thinks that they should go lecture to those kindergartners and preschool. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what they did in the studies. That's not, I, you know, I don't want to lead you to believe that. But this is the kind of instruction that was facilitative and knowing those skills is really important. Now, there are some folks out there these days that are saying you even have to know your PA at a higher level than that to do well. They don't really have the research evidence yet of those claims. They're interesting claims, but I'm not going to push anything unless it has real serious conclusive findings behind it. There is absolutely no excuse not to make sure kids can hear the sounds within words in preschool and kindergarten and grade one. There just isn't an excuse for it. 
Um, these kinds of things, all these different skills that you can teach. And the research says focus on one or two of these, not all of these at once. Uh, it gets too confusing. We're talking little kids. You're not trying to... And you know where I got these from? Right out of your state standards. So I didn't... This isn't something... Oh, he's bringing us all this stuff that doesn't exist. It's here. All these skills, this is in your state standards of, of all these different PA skills. And why... And, yeah, why don't I just stop there?